Um, so I first encountered Peter at King Edward's when I arrived in the autumn of 51. Peter had spent, I think that was his second year there, um, so just settling in, although I think he'd had a hard time during his first year because he wasn't by nature a disciplinarian. He's a very easygoing guy, really. Um, but um, to keep control of a class of 30 boys, you had to get tough sometimes. And he, I think he decided that he, he would need to get tough in order to keep order. So I think he, on one occasion, he asserted himself and the boy, he didn't look back from then. Because he came, as I remember him, certainly, um, I didn't find him severe, but you wouldn't mess with him. <laughs> um, yes, I think that was true for a lot of the masters at that time. They, they put on a, a, an appearance of being strict, but when you knew them privately, they weren't like that at all. It was a big act for a lot of them. Um, but I liked Peter from start, uh, it's probably because art was one of the few subjects I was any good at, so I, I switched on to it very quickly. And, probably got a bit of his attention as well, so, yes. As far as I'm aware, Peter Falk's life started out in Beminster in Dors Dorset. Um, uh, although his father his family may correct me on this, but his father was manager of the Cowan Gate milk processing uh, place at Wincanton, so further, uh, a bit further west than that. I'm not sure if they lived in Wincanton, but I know people were born in Bannister, so he's a Dorset man by birth. Um, and uh, his, his twin, he and his twin brother uh, went to a school called Sexy's School, which are, uh, seems to have been quite an, an elitist school. Um, his brother was apparently a lot brighter than he was, Peter would claim, and the only thing that uh, Peter could do was paint from a very early age. He had a, I would think we would say, a religious upbringing. Yes. At least. I, mean, I don't, I don't think it stuck with him, but he... Um, no, it wasn't sort of rigid. He, he did lots of paintings of churches. Yes. Does that count yes. as being religious? <laughs> well, I think it became clear that he would follow some kind of painting course and uh, he went off, uh, after sexy school, he went off to Bristol College of Art to do a course in, uh, to prepare to be an art teacher. Uh, then that, of course, was, was interrupted by the World War II and he was taken off to uh, to join the army. And he told me that he was on a train going up to enlist and uh, some of the other guys on the train were talking about what, they, what kind of services they would offer the army. And one of them apparently was a, he's maybe a draftsman and he said well, he thought he'd offer that something. So Peter of course as a drawer and a painter thought well that's a good idea, I'll do that too. And that's, that's what he ended up doing in fact. Yeah I think all, all the other three were all going to be draftsmen. Mm, right. And Dad said, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, oh, I could do that. Yes. That's a drawing, that'd be great. Yes. That's, he didn't want to that's go shooting people. He, he wanted to go and, and keep drawing if he could. He was put on a troop ship. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if he knows where he was embarked. Mm -hmm. In the army, you were just... We weren't told. Yes, get in this truck. <laughs> where are we going? Wherever it takes you. Yeah. And um, he was put on a troop ship, which mm -hmm. did quite a, a circuitous route mm -hmm. to try and avoid the U-boats mm -hmm. um, and he ended up, he got off and he was in Africa. They would have moved eastward and then across, um, I don't know if he ever went to Malta, Sicily and then Sicily, into Italy. I think. That's I, think, what I, I think, think he was in Sicily. Think it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he was certainly up through... Then moving steadily Italy. up through Italy. Yeah. yeah. But he so, had quite a long period in Foggia. Yeah. He had a bombed out house which um, had water part way up and electricity part way up. Yeah. I think he managed to get electricity installed up to the top yeah. so that he could make his blueprints, which was yeah. his job at the time. Yeah. And um, he would sort of retreat to his lab up mm. in the mm. in the rafters where nobody else went because it was mm. all open to the elements and mm. what have you. But mm. 
presumably southern Italy mm. most of the year is, is fairly good. Mm. Can you go over again what what these marks are? They look like well, it, this they is look one like of the, electric circuitry. This is one of the blueprints that yeah. he made. Yeah. Um, it's headed up circuit diagram, mm -hmm. Foggia Enclave. Mm -hmm. Foggia is a little town in southern Italy. Mm -hmm. um, it purports to be, and certainly we were fooled, that it's a, a circuit diagram of a piece mm -hmm. of machinery or electronic equipment. Mm -hmm. And all of the component parts, when you actually get an atlas out and have a look, mm -hmm. they are um, towns in that locality within the Foggia enclave. Yeah. It's nice to know that one's father wasn't just sort of drawing pretty pictures yeah. while everybody yeah. was out yeah. fighting and what yeah. have you. And it, it, his, yeah. his contribution to the war effort. Yeah. And it was obviously appreciated for him to have his mentioned in dispatches. Absolutely. Oak Leaf. There's some evidence that he was in Florence. There's a, there's a, a bl tiny black and white photograph uh, of, of an, uh, what looks like a large art studio in a, in a college somewhere and a painting that looks very much like one of his paintings and on the back of the photograph it says Formation School Florence and as a budding painter I guess I mean Florence being a centre of art would be attractive to him so maybe on the way up through Italy he thought I'll try and spend some time in Florence. My dad was stuck in the army for two years after the war ended Yeah. Um, presumably as part of the school occupation force or whatever it was politely called by the British yes. um, who, who looked after Italy until it was handed mm. back to the Italians mm. Mm. Um, he always felt it was a bit of a waste of time because yeah. this he considered proper war, war work yes. whereas he was drawing magazines and posters, comes, for, dances. Yeah, posters for the dance <laughs> yes. on Saturday yes. night and, uh, yes I've seen I, I like the Christmas yeah. ones <laughs> but uh, the fact that he got to to Florence and was able mm. to look around and, and mm. see all the stuff that was there mm. yeah he would have been delighted with that <clears throat> yeah And then he went back to art college to continue his studies and finished in, I think, 1949. Number one thing about Peter is he was a brilliant draftsman. I think one can say that. Well, that's the first thing that comes into my so mind. It's consummate. I mean, yeah. the draftsmanship yeah. is, yeah. is astonishing uh, for a young man. Um, you know, it, it's, draw, it, it's, it's freely drawn, but you can't see where he's made mistakes and corrected them, it's pretty much bang on. Yeah. And it's a very complicated uh, series of figures, mm. with figures behind others mm. and their different um, gestures. Yeah. It's all about gestures. Yeah. I mean, this could be, looking at this, it, it could be, you know, 17th century. Mm. It, it, mm. It, it, it's got that sort of antiquity mm. feel about it, yeah. which surprised me you were saying it's 1949, because, yeah. you know, we've had um, gosh, a hundred years since, almost, since the Impressionists, you know, the birth of the modern movement. And yet this is harking back to the yeah. um, Baroque era. So you say the painting's dark, well, you know, dark and light, chiaroscuro, that's very yes. much part of the 17th century. Yes. Gradually you see the development of the influence of the post-Impressionists, particularly of the Camden Town group of painters, formed by Sickert in the early 1900s. And there's a lot of, I think, a lot of approval of those paintings and a lot of people like them. Uh, and some would say he should have stayed with that style of painting, which is oil, a style of oil painting. Um, others, I think, advised him to move on and develop his own style. Straight away, that shouts Harold Gilman. Mm. That would be a if you look at Harold Gilman poses, yeah. yes. that's Harold Gilman. Yeah. Um, it's beautifully painted. He can mm. handle oil paint, yes. um, but it's a straight take from that. Also, that the brass bed, that's sicker, that's kind of town yeah. painting, which yeah. was 
you know, news or semi-clothed models, yeah. uh, back of, quite often backlit, that gleam of light he talks mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, in shabby dark bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And that's straight out of Camden Townism, mm -hmm. if you like, mm -hmm. yeah. So he has, I can see why the tutor would have said, you know, you need to develop your own style. He's, he's clearly a huge talent, but he's, I mean, all artists nick stuff from other artists. Yeah. But, and yeah. that's how you start yeah. out. I mean, yeah. I started copying Turners when I was a teenager at school. Yes. You know, I chose the best artists. Yeah. Um, and he's obviously doing something similar. So you're working out, you, you, you're choosing what you like, and then you're copying them, or you're doing yes. uh, pastiches to say how, how the artist got there, how's he done that, before you work on your own... Sure. Development. So it's an interesting finding a way. Yeah, but what a, what a great start to his career to have chosen very English. Yes. yes. Uh, it's realism. Yes. Um, it's subject everyday subject matter that he can mm. tackle. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to go to Venice. Or, you know, no. it's under his you know under his nose. What yeah. he like? What he's obviously likes, and I think he probably played with that with the earlier work. His mm -hmm. light. So he's, mm -hmm. he has. Artificial light here, and he has yes. natural light coming in here, yes. so he has, yes. you know, light and shade. I think he's, yeah. he plays with it very well. I love the way he's got the light coming through. Yeah, absolutely. The yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. And this so is an atmosphere, isn't it? You can sense the atmosphere. Yes. But if you look, if you also look at Robert Bevan's paintings, mm -hmm. and he made lithographs of some of them, mm -hmm. of his favourite, mm -hmm. which are black and white, mm -hmm. the figures are very much like. You know, it gives that mm. that essence mm. that comes across to me. Yeah. So I can see the Camden Town yes. influence in there, even yes. even though I wouldn't say that's a Camden Town painting, but I can okay. see, okay. Um, you know, yeah. the influence. So he's actually what's interesting about him is he's alive to art historical influences coming in mm. and playing with them, Very much so. which is what a lot of artists do, but not 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 mm. not, not by, by no means everybody. Mm. Usually. An artist will go to an exhibition, mm. happened to me, mm. and and be knocked out by a show mm. by one artist or whatever, mm. and that that will change their life, you yeah. know. Soon after arriving in Southampton for his first teaching job, he's clearly beginning to paint in with cubist influences. You can see that in some of his early work, and there was a lot in the city of Southampton, although it was a bombed out city at the time. Still, uh, there was a lot. Um, in the city to fit his cubist tendency, I would say, at the time. Cubism says you can move stuff around as you want to, and I suppose that's what he's done, isn't he? You could argue he's, he's, he's played around with shapes, which he, is what cubism allowed. He would say, if you want to do it exactly as it is, yeah. take a photograph. Yeah. Yes. If you yeah. want to take that and make it better, mm. because that building should be over there to get yes. the perspective, yes. and he yeah. would move things like yes. that quite freely. Yes, yes, yes. He he moved Marchwood Power Station to make single-handedly <laughs> to make it look right. Yes. Oh. It took me a little while. I was trying to work out the, the, one of the paintings at Redbridge. Yeah, I just. Can't see that's right. Something. <laughs> and like, ah, that's what he's done. And as Peter settled in Southampton, he became fascinated by the old, uh, the war-torn city, the damage to the city, um, and he would look out parts of the city which were very commonplace, and became fascinated by things as basic as city pavements and roads and markings on the roads and he was always he became very interested in textures of the textures of things of the very of very commonplace things textures and colors of commonplace things The painting halfway up the stairs yeah. uh, looks as if it's just a piece of road. Which yeah, is what it is. Com yeah, complete. And he did lots of road paintings, complete. road surface paintings. Complete with chewing gum. He spent a lot looking down yeah. at road surfaces. But this shows some of his sense of humour in a way. Yes. When you yeah. look at it, it's a, a painting of the road. Yes. When you know it's called <clears throat> the crucifix. Mm. I think you look at it totally differently, Very different, and you think, yes. "Oh, yes. I can see. Yes, yes. it's a, it's yes. sort of a man 
hiding yes. in the road, as it were. Yes. Northern fascinated him. It was part of the older part of the city, um, and the rather dilapidated buildings of that period fascinated him. But then <clears throat> the dockyards, of, co of course, the cranes have gone now, but um, Peter's increasing interest in the geometry of what he was seeing. Um, the cranes uh, and the ships um, in the docks gave him a lot of inspiration. And perhaps that's what moved him towards Cubism, which is all about geometry. So if you look at a lot of paintings during this period, you're seeing uh, geometry developing rectangles. Um, and the scenes of the old floating bridge with its cranes in the distance and shipyards in the distance. Peter spent a lot of time down there in that part of town. And out at Redbridge, where the railway from Southampton Central headed westwards across the River Test, across the mud flats of the River Test. And Peter, as they lived at Millbrook, he was very near. He spent quite a bit of time uh, painting scenes at Redbridge. And then I remember him disappearing off into a little tiny box room uh, in the house we lived in in uh, Millbrook um, to do painting. Um, on a Sunday morning, uh, mum would then call him down at lunchtime and I expect Andy can remember as well, we used to make butterflies out of what was left of his paints on his palette um, on pieces of newspaper. It was all oil paints in them days, wasn't it? Yes. Being the younger brother, my, my memories of, of growing up in Mansell differ from Richard's for probably about three years. Um, yeah, I certainly remember the box room, um, which was, you almost weren't allowed in there. That was Dad's little private space. It wasn't I big. Don't, I don't think we could get in there. It was <laughs> crammed full of everything and anything. But in the course of school, Peter, Peter ran other things. He was very involved with the, the school play, which was put on every autumn. So he'd do the scenery for that and the costumes for that. Um, he ran a puppet club. Um, he was a very diverse man. I mean, have a go at anything. He wasn't just a painter. Um, I, I can recall looking through the door and seeing a, a castle which he was making me for my birthday when I was like five years old, six years old, somewhere around there. So uh, his, his artwork certainly sped over into the family life and wasn't solely on canvas. We would often go off on holidays and to strange places like Portland, but at least sketch and then he'd paint when he came home. So I think it was his, the, the main theme of his life all the time. I can remember going up on the hills and um, using the chalk to make um, pictures. And I can also remember him making super duper sand cast or sand art, uh, sort of mermaid tails around my mum's waist and things <laughs> like that. <laughs> Was she half buried in the sand or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then of course we'd have us decorated with bits of seaweed and shells and what have you. So, but um, yeah, the um, when we went on holiday, it was always a holiday. It was n not a working holiday for Dad. Um, I don't remember him particularly going off and 
doing drawings and sketches and what have you. Peter was born at Beminster, which is not so far away from Portland, and probably as a boy he came down here. But later when he had his two sons and his wife Muriel, they would camp at the top of the hill and Peter would paint um, scenes. He painted something like 20 oils of the area, especially on the top, the, top, the, the quarries and the coastline from the top. Um, so his family camped and he painted. Um, once again, what would appeal to him would be the, the natural tendency of the rock to fall into cubes of stone, with naturally cracking in that way, and those shapes would very much appeal to him. Any houses built at Fortune's Well were built on a slope, a very higgly-biggly, and that appealed very much to Peter Foulkes because he liked um, uneven structures, changes in level and things like that. So that will be very appealing to him. And the pebbles of course, these pebbles make wonderful patterns for, for an artist, colour variation. And it's interesting that a lot of his paintings on Portland, uh, he only uses blue and uh, sort of terracotta, colour, burnt sienna for his painting, which very much how it looks today. We're looking at blues in the sunlight. We're looking at blues and browns only. Why did Portland appeal to you so much, Peter, apart from a camping holiday? Well, I'm just looking for places where which hit me in the face and yes. said, so that's lovely, I must make a painting for that. Yeah. Why do you think it hit you in the face? Uh, well, I just like the combination of the natural big stones in the foreground yeah. uh, with the man-made in the background. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I put a few figures in just to give it a sense of place. Yes. He brought with him his painter friend Sidney Greenwood. That would be in around, around about 1962 before his trip to, to America, where he went off for six, uh, six months. But you can see in his uh, paintings of Portland, you can see um, pre-tastes of his paintings in America, where he, he saw the shapes of the stone were repeated in the shapes of the, of the skyscrapers, the squares and rectangles of skyscrapers. So one thing I think led to another. In the early 60s, Dad won a goldsmith travelling scholarship to go to America for five months, I think it was. 1963? Thereabouts, yes. And uh, he went travelling <coughs> and bought a 99-day ticket on Greyhound buses for $99. Mm -hmm. 
and he had five dollars a day spending money mm -hmm. and he went all the way around America mm -hmm. um, and if He'd go to art galleries and he'd get chatting to people and he might get invited to stay or mm -hmm. he, he made lifelong friends from mm -hmm. some of the places he went. He mm -hmm. had a few addresses and phone numbers of people to, to contact when he first went. But he, mm -hmm. he went around and he, he would travel extensively and, and was influenced by what he saw. Mm -hmm. You've still got the blocks, the blocks. cubism is still, yeah. still yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but these have become much more abstract. He's not trying to represent anything, he's playing no. around with images. Um, and he did a lot of them with the, the triangle design, yes. being the windows. Yes. And he, he would have a potato, <coughs> and he chopped this potato <coughs> print <coughs> to, to make the shape, and then he would dip it in the paint, and it would be long, long, long. And you've seen him do that? Yeah. But that was after his return from the That state. was after when he came so, back from the so States to help to duplicate you know, how, many, how, many, uh, how many windows does he yes. need to paint if, right. when he was doing that style. Right. And, yeah, they, they'd all be in that style. So he was doing actually. some printing as well yeah. on, the, on his paintings. Printing yeah. oils and acrylics. Yeah. East Coast to the West Coast, up through the northern states, and then came back down through sort of Texas um, and down through Florida and what have you, and then back to back to New York. <clears throat> and he then had a studio in New York for two or three months before he came home. Um, he then had a private view about 18 months later, and we were lucky enough to go off to America with him. I think in the 60s that's where you would go if yeah. you were interested in art and culture. America is the, you know, it's, yes. the, it's, it's the, because the war, I mean, our, our, I say to people, art does not exist in a vacuum. Mm. It, 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 it's, a, it's a result of you know, religious, social, uh, economic, mm. industrial, mm. military history mm. and the First World War, mm. you know, without that there may not have been uh, surrealism, without the Second World War there may not have been abstract expressionism. Mm. It changes the whole scene, and so that the Second World War closes down Paris as the centre of, con of progressive right, art, and right. it goes to, to New York, America. Right. So that's where artists are going to go. Right. So I suggest that's probably what attracted it. And it, the plan was he would return to King Edwards, but soon after that he got an offer from the art college to go there as a as a lecturer, which I think King Edwards' headmaster was disappointed at that. I think he, he was a bit miffed that that he'd given Peter time off to go to America, and he was going to leave. So, um, yeah, I, I think he was a bit cold shouldered after that. But, I mean, it was a good offer, it was a good move for Peter um, in, in all sorts of ways. And he ended up as head of fine art there, of course, years later. And a lot of his teaching was, was involved in, uh, with mature students. So there were quite a lot of um, middle-aged people in the city at that time who wanted to Maybe they were doing another job, but they wanted to take up painting and Peter, Peter coached and developed a lot of mature painters and became very well known in the city for, because of that. If 
folks did uh, uh, quite a large series of paintings based on the cow and uh, not to understate that in in almost all of them the cow filled the whole picture and his inspiration came from a painter called John Vine he was around 1809 to 1867 and like Peter John Vine almost filled the, filled the page uh, with his scene of cows and I, and I think the original idea came from John Vine's painting for Peter to do this series which are all about texture really and Peter played around with a number of techniques including sponging with uh, with newspaper um, and also spattering and using rollers so it wasn't typically brush painting it was very experimental but it resulted in a very popular series of, of paintings um, over quite a long period and I think he had n a number of commissions he would have had a number of commissions because the, the, the theme was, was a popular one and almost all of them had a, a humorous element to them um, for example um, one of them would be a picture of, of a cow leaping with a moon in the background and it would be the title would be the cow jumped over the moon and there was another one a cow with a wooden leg and Peters replaced one of the cow's legs with a table leg <laughs> a turned table leg um, but in this article Peter explains how he sets about doing a series of paintings. I think they were very popular series, yes, yes, yes. I think partly for the humour. And I think his, um, a lot of Peter's customers, if I can use that, were also his, his students, because he taught mature students, not sort of just left school students who, didn't, who had no funds. I think these more mature students were able to buy his paintings in a way that younger students might not have been. And also that the art of, um, of that period, I think Peter's work would have been more popular with perhaps middle-aged people than younger people who would be influenced by the new forms of art, you know, Andy Warhol and stuff like that. The more, <laughs> uh, what shall I say? adventurous stars of art. Peter's, Peter's stars, it, they were very experimental. I wouldn't quite say they were adventurous. I mean, they were not They were never going to be shocking in the way that some of the later artists, or even artists of his, of his period were. Peter didn't set out to shock, even though he had some humor. There's a, a, a link with his series on gravestones also because he used the similar techniques on some of his gravestone paintings which again were very popular and took him back to his favourite theme which is churches and churchyards. Um, but, but the techniques were very similar in his, in his um, gravestone paintings using, as I said, spattering and, and sponging and other techniques. Are they gloomy? They are. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, because I, if you'd said what are they, I wouldn't have said yeah. gravestones. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, you, just, you, it's just pattern and text, isn't it? You would it? pick out the text. Yeah. So this so obviously is obviously sacred, yeah. This is Lichin. This is Lichin, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're details, he's like. Yeah, he's, he's zeroing in on, on, right. on an element yeah. of it because yeah. here you have, yeah. you know, it looks like a music set out of a bracker, a Picasso cubist work. Um, yeah, so that's he's abstracting, he's abstracting somehow. from from the subject. Peter did return uh, to themes quite often. Whether that was um, at a request to paint something in that series or whether it was his own ideas, 
I was looking at some of his paintings from Redbridge this morning and I, I had assumed that they were all painted around the same time which is soon after Peter arrived in the city, so in 1950 or so but I found one of them was painted in 64 so he went back to his original sketches and painted sometimes from those sketches even though it was years later whether that was his own desire to do so maybe with a new technique or whether he had a commission I suspect it was sometimes because he had commissions so he, he had a large collection of, of t um, sketchbooks um, and he would often return to those sketchbooks to base his paintings even years later yeah. He told me once that uh, during a visit to the Channel Islands he'd seen in an antique shop an old military tunic from the days of British Empire um, on a tailor's dummy in, the, in an antique shop and it had given, them, given him an idea for a series of paintings which over a long period from 1970, the first was in 1972 and the last in 2004, a total of 132 paintings in this series. They're, they're an interesting departure from his, from most of his work in not so much in technique perhaps but in in style. What's notable about them apart from them all have, all, of, all of them has at least one military tunic displayed in the center um, but around it Peter has um, he's painted scenes but also he's transferred images from books and magazines um, and other sources of, of military history. He visited military museums to get the details right of, of, of the, the, mili the different military tunics that he painted, a wide range of styles and, uh, and colours and, and ornamentation of, tun of these tunics from that period. He was very meticulous about researching them. The techniques he used, uh, mentioned transfer, transfer techniques, but he would use acrylic paints also to, um, to give the impression of aging of the picture. As it was as if this picture had been found in an attic somewhere and it had been gathering dust and, and mildew and so on. So it was a sort of uh, a finish he gave them, uh, so it gave a sort of an atmosphere of distance, of, of ageing. The subject, the, the soldier who, or the officer who wore the uniform, is now dead. <laughs> that, that's clear. But the painting is looking back at them, their life, their military history, but also looking at their loved ones. So you, you get an image of, the, of, a, of a woman transferred onto the painting or a group of children, or other people. The symbolism, it, it's more than trying to represent something in a way that painters often do, like painting a tree or a landscape. This is not about that at all. And the sim, symbolists were into that. And symbolism is, was not a new idea in, amongst the post-impressionists. I mean, you could even say that some of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings were symbolist. The Virgin of the Rocks, for example, is not a painting of a group of people in a landscape. It's, it's putting forward an idea. It's a, it's a picture of Mary um, and holding the Christ child, if I remember correctly. Um, so that is, I think if we gave this series a label, it would be, they would be symbolist paintings. That's, that's my interpretation anyway. They all would seem to me to be telling a story, as I've said, of the futility of war and yet the glory of war. And, and the impact of war upon people back at home. Um, the Cow series we've talked about, um, though almost all of those had an element of humour about them in the pictures themselves, the paintings themselves, but also in the titles. These are entirely different. There's, there, there's nothing amusing about them. There, there's a deep sadness about them, I would say.
After school I followed him uh, in two ways. One, he and some friends set up a small gallery in Northern. It was called the Hamwick Gallery. It was in one of the old shops on Northern Road. And um, Peter exhibited there several times a year. I remember going there to see his exhibitions. And also the City Art Gallery put on a show called Painter's Progress every year. So local painters could put in uh, their paintings, you know, and uh, as a sort of competition, painting competition. Uh, so I would follow painter, uh, Peter's work over the years by doing those two things. And I once bumped into him in the art gallery, which is nice, mm. and uh, reminded him that I was one of his pupils. I don't know if you remember me or not at that stage. And then uh, for years I had no connection with Peter at all but discovered that he lived in Swaveling in the same road that my daughter lived in. I saw him walking past my daughter's house one day and went out and spoke to him and from then on I kind of uh, I visited him a couple of times and I got back into drawing and painting as well. He suggested my taking some of my attempts you know for him to see and he gave me some feedback on them very graciously. <laughs> Uh, he, some, some of his students found him tough and critical, um, but he was very gentle with me, certainly. I think when, once he retired, particularly, he, he became far more prolific. Obviously, he didn't have the, the duties of school and college and have you to worry about. Mm -hmm. mm. I think there was often quite a sort of a timetable laid down by my mum as to when he would paint and when he wouldn't side of his life out between them so that he did have time for family and everything else. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. His, his painting became more prolific and uh, more time consuming um, as time went by. But, you know, that was his way of filling his time when he retired. You know, other people have allotments, gardens and everything, but Dad had his art. Um, Peter always painted landscape. He loved the English countryside, especially in the south, although he and his family did venture north to Yorkshire and um, places like that. Um, but he loved to be out in the open drawing and painting. And um, that would take him to, not only to landscape scenes, but also to farm buildings. He was very interested in farm buildings and the equipment that would often be hanging around farms. Very often old, uh, unused equipment, rusting equipment. Uh, we're talking about watercolours, by the way. At this stage of his life, he is mostly using watercolour and became uh, recognised in his ability with watercolour. Um, he would say that he owed, was influenced very much in his landscapes, he was influenced by a painter called Eric Revillius. He used very dilute watercolour paint to give transparency and some of Peter's landscapes echo Eric Revelius' work. While he was out in the countryside, if he saw something that fascinated him, he would stop and paint it. He liked to bring figures into his landscapes, whether it be um, people walking in front of a church or whether an angel sitting on the top of a chapel at Stockbridge. He would like to add something to give some human interest perhaps. Peter also talked about the influence of an American-German 
painter called Feininger, Lionel Feininger, who um, began his life as a cartoonist. And it's interesting that some of Peter's uh, earlier drawings were cartoon figures. Feininger, um, you could call him a cubist, I suppose. What's typical of his work is distortion, whether he's painting figures, human figures, in landscapes or buildings, and he did a lot of uh, churches. So at the same time that Peter was working on um, churches and buildings from a cubist perspective, uh, Peter was also interested in the human figure. So again, working from a sketch, a realistic sketch, uh, a life sketch, he would then translate that into a cubist um, painting, a watercolour painting. He's a bit of a polymath in terms of, of, oh, yeah. of making art, isn't he? Yes. An image maker, yes. if you like. Yes. Rather yes. than a yes. single. Yes. I mean, look at someone like Bridget yes. Riley, you know, you look at yeah. her work, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's down one tunnel. And she, like a lot of artists, they do it again and again and again and again. That is to, not to, Peter. To, that, absolutely not, no. That is, no. Not, that is not his no. character. And if you're making a name mm. as mm. an artist, mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of competition you, about. You have to. You have to because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if yeah. you don't, if you're yeah. if you if you're um, if you're making your money yeah. from selling art and you've yeah. got a good gallery and agent, yeah. they will say, yes. do more like that because yeah. they sell. Yes. I don't want those, yes. and that's a huge yeah. disadvantage and frustration for your personal development. Yeah. But Peter's free to do what he wants, and he's going down all sorts of avenues. Probably, probably lots yeah. of balls in the air. Well, I'll try this. I'll try that. Yeah. But I'm coming back to the whole thing about pattern mm. making. Mm. Um, the geometry, mm. which he can play with in different mm. styles and, mm. and different movements. But I'm wondering if his job as a teacher and a lecturer. Ah, uh, well, that's the other thing. Influenced yeah, influenced him absolutely. Because he was having yeah. to, he was, he did a lot of demonstrations. Yeah, you know, well, in, in the class. Lucky students, and you know, yeah. I, I know that he was uh, much loved by yeah, his students because was. he was yeah. obviously a very good teacher. Yeah. and the two don't go yeah. together normally. You know. No. Some artists can do it, some can't. Mm. But if you are a polymath yeah. and you've got all these ideas, yeah. you can see things in your students' work and say, yeah. well, have a look yeah. at this art, have a look at that. Yeah. And um, he will be picking up yeah. from what his art students are doing as well. Because yeah. I've, I've, I've come across that with, yeah. art, with artists who teach. Yeah. They do, they, it's a two-way thing. It works for you best. Mm. And that will influence his yeah. thought because things seep into your consciousness. Yeah. My mother told me that when I was five years old, I said I wanted to be an artist. This has always been my ambition, in spite of the serious drawbacks of being born a twin. My brother was academically brilliant and was immediately promoted into the second form when we entered grammar school, setting him on a path to become a professor in biochemistry. My performance at school was less than spectacular, in an environment where art counted for nothing at all. Fortunately, I showed little ability to, to succeed in anything else, which persuaded my parents to allow me to enrol at the West of England College of Art on a five-year course leading to a teaching qualification. I hated the, the idea of teaching, but this was 1940, and I was 17, with the inevitability of being conscripted when I became 18 and a half. Life was wonderful for me, away at last from comparisons with my brother, immersing myself in a course of drawing, mostly from the nude, with German bombing and overnight fire watching to enliven many of the evenings. Five years were spent in the army working as a signals draftsman in Africa, Sicily and Italy, when I was promoted a corporal and awarded a mention in dispatches in 1944. Demobilised, I returned to my studies in painting on a generous government grant. In 1950, I was given my first teaching post as senior art master at King Edward VI School in Southampton. I was married at this time and the first of our two sons had been born. It took me a year to come to terms with teaching before I found I enjoyed it and managed to combine 
what was a very demanding job with the needs of my family and as much painting as possible. In 1963, I was awarded a travelling scholarship to spend six months in the USA, painting under the American influence. This completely changed my life, persuading me that it was time to move away from school teaching. So two years later, I was a lecturer at Southampton College of Art, where I found fulfilment developing structured courses for part-time mature students. In addition, I began teaching on week-long residential courses in this country and abroad during my summer vacations, as well as giving demonstrations, lectures and criticisms to art societies in the south of England. Thankfully, I've been able to continue this work with painting running parallel to my teaching at each stage. I was fortunate enough to achieve membership of the Royal West of England Academy in 1952 and of the Royal Institute, Institute of Painters in Watercolour in 1969. It was so much easier to get elected in those days when fewer people painted seriously. Since retiring as Head of Fine Art at Southampton Institute of Higher Education ten years ago, I've been able to devote much time to painting, mostly in watercolour and acrylic. And every day I think how lucky I've been to do all the things I've wanted to do in my life and to look back on my production of over a thousand paintings, remembering the happy struggle of producing each of them. So that's Peter's description of his life and his work. And his, uh, as I remember him now, several years after his passing, I, I can uh, remember his frequently saying how happy he was to have painted to spend his life doing what he really enjoyed doing. And he would be saying that with a twinkle in his eye. <laughs> he was so positive about his life. He, you know, even in his very later days, if you asked him, you know, a question like, you know, how do you feel about your life? Be, oh, I, I've, I've had a great life, he'd say. Something I've been lucky because I've been able to do what I wanted to do yes, yes. and I got paid for it. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So yes. he never wanted to do anything but no. paint. Mm. And I think his mm. his mother had said once upon a time, you know, whatever we're going to do with Peter, mm. all he can do is paint. Mm. And that's all he ever did. <laughs> that's what he did. Yeah.